And in the next session, we're going to learn about another topic that we hear about all the time and affects, affects so many people. Um, factors that cause sleep challenges through your ovarian cancer journey. Also going to explore some sleep aids that could be helpful in the treatment of insomnia and try to identify some behaviors and beliefs that you could change in order to help improve your sleep. So I would like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Jose Savard and Kaylee Rook. Uh, Dr. Savard is a professor, professor of psychology at Laval University and also a researcher at Laval University Cancer Research Center. She is also a clinical psychologist who specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy and psychooncology. She is recognized as an international leader in the study of cancer-related insomnia. In 2020, she co-edited the Handbook of Sleep Disorders in Medical Conditions, which received the Prose Award of the Association of American Publishers for the Best Handbook in Medicine and Clinical Science. Kaylee Rook lives in Abbotsford, British Columbia, though her heart will always be on the prairies where her family resides, where she teaches. She was diagnosed with stage three high-grade serous ovarian cancer in April of 2022, and is elated to have just celebrated one year of NED or no evidence of disease this past week. Congratulations, Kaylee, that's awesome. Tonight, Kaylee will be sharing her lived experience with the different challenges of insomnia, fatigue, and falling asleep after an ovarian cancer diagnosis. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Dr. Savard and Kaylee. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, with you tonight to talk about uh, a topic I've been studying for the past 25 years now. So, um, uh, and my hope tonight is to uh, provide you with some practical tips to improve uh, your sleep. Um, what's going on? Okay. Um, let's start by um, define what is insomnia. It, actually, there are several types of insomnia. Uh, one may have uh, difficulties uh, falling asleep at bedtime, which is called uh, initial insomnia. Uh, one may also have difficulty staying asleep during the night, which is called uh, middle insomnia. And terminal insomnia is defined as uh, uh, awakening too early in the morning. And uh, often uh, people will have a combination of those difficulties uh, and this is called mixed insomnia. It's also important to uh, distinguish um, having um, an insomnia disorder from having some insomnia symptoms. And the insomnia disorder is defined as having one of those uh, types of sleep difficulties at least three nights per week for a duration of at least one month. And uh, also chronic insomnia is defined as meeting all of these criteria for a period of at least three months. Um, in the study that we uh, conducted uh, now more than 10 years ago among uh, nearly 1,000 uh, patients with cancer, who were um, awaiting a surgery. Um, as you can see here, uh, uh, actually we assessed the prevalence of insomnia. And uh, as you can see here, we add a large proportion of the sample who uh, was composed of breast cancer patients, but we add 12% uh, 12 per 12 of the sample who were uh, women with gynecological cancer and the other subgroup that was um, more represented was composed of men with prostate cancer, 27% of the sample. And uh, we found in terms of the prevalence of insomnia, we found that um, the prevalence was the highest uh, in the period surrounding uh, the surgery. So at the first time point of the study, we found that 59% of the patients had either uh, some, some levels of insomnia symptoms or met the diagnostic criteria for an insomnia syndrome or an insomnia uh, disorder. And as you can see, the prevalence of insomnia decreased over time, 
but there were still 36% of the patients who had either insomnia symptoms or an insomnia syndrome at the 18 month evaluation. So that was 18 months following uh, the surgery. And this is at least twice as prevalent as in the general population. And um, when we compare the three groups that were the more the most represented in our sample, uh, we found that uh, insomnia was more prevalent in women with breast and gynecological cancer than in men with prostate cancer. And um, we also found in that study that insomnia tended to persist over time. So we found actually that 51 uh, persistence rate of 51%, and that was defined as having insomnia on two consecutive time points of the study. And we also found in the same study that among women, who, uh, among patients who had an insomnia syndrome at the first time point of the study, 38% of them kept on uh, having an insomnia disorder on each and every time point of the study. So this is also, um, this also reflects the chronicity of insomnia in the context of cancer. So clearly that we need to better uh, detect these difficulties in uh, patients receiving treatment for cancer. But why is insomnia so common in cancer? So there are three types of risk factors the predisposing factors, which are the factors that increase individuals' vulnerability to have insomnia in their lifetime. Uh, there's also precipitating factors, and those are the factors that trigger the, the onset of an insomnia episode at a specific time point. And those are often stressors or stressful events. And we know that cancer is characterized by many uh, stressful events. So th th this is one reason why insomnia is so common in cancer patients. And there are also uh, the perpetuating factors, and those are the variables that contribute in maintaining the sleep difficulties over time. And those are important because the intervention is going to uh, target those specific factors uh, more specifically. So I'm gonna give some examples of those uh, factors. So in terms of predisposing factors, uh, younger age was found to be associated with an increased risk for insomnia in uh, the cancer population. Uh, female sex was also associated with an increased risk. Um, also having an hyperarousability trait. So this is the tendency to get uh, cognitively and emotionally and physically aroused when uh, exposed to some stressful situations, and also having some uh, personal antecedents of insomnia. So if you had suffered from insomnia in the past, uh, it makes you more vulnerable to experience insomnia when um, after uh, cancer is diagnosed. And um, so in terms of uh, factors that trigger an insomnia episode, um, you, uh, we can find uh, hospitalization, uh, the psychological reaction also to the cancer diagnosis, and before that, the, the investigation that leads to uh, the cancer diagnosis, and then afterwards, um, each uh, cancer treatment and their side effects. And side effects uh, are particularly influential, especially in the context of ovarian cancer, the menopausal symptoms that are associated with uh, ovariectomy or chemotherapy and also hormone therapy. Uh, so we know that those treatments can induce uh, premature menopause in uh, younger women or aggravate uh, pre-existing menopausal symptoms in those who had already transitioned transition to uh, postmenopause, um, <clears throat> pain, uh, nausea, and vomiting can also be associated with sleep impairments, uh, nocturia, so having to um, uh, having some incontinence uh, can be associated with sleep impairments, fatigue 
is uh, often seen as a consequence of insomnia. And it is true that it could be uh, an effect, but it can also be a risk factor for insomnia because when uh, we are fatigued, we tend to uh, rest and nap more during the day. And this may uh, desynchronize our uh, sleep-wake rhythms. So um, that may be a risk factor. And some medications and other substances can also uh, lead to some sleep difficulties, uh, such as corticosteroids that are given along uh, chemotherapy to prevent uh, nausea and vomiting. And uh, in terms of perpetuating factors, um, uh, there are two uh, uh, categories of perpetuating factors. So uh, the maladaptive sleep behaviors and erroneous uh, beliefs about sleep. Uh, I'm gonna be uh, talking about that in more details uh, a little later. So this figure shows that uh, predisposing factors, so the factors that increase one's vulnerability to suffer from insomnia in your lifetime are not sufficient to trigger an insomnia episode. It's not sufficient to uh, exceed that um, theoretical uh, threshold uh, from which insomnia develops. It, so it is when you experience some stressful situations, so the, the so-called precipitating factors that insomnia will uh, begin. And then uh, afterwards, when you experience some sleep difficulties, um, you tend to uh, develop some uh, behaviors to compensate for the sleep loss that you experience. And uh, also to, um, and, and maybe uh, perceive their, these sleep difficulties as more uh, catastrophic than they really are. And those two factors will uh, be influential in maintaining the sleep difficulties over time. So. Uh, the the insomnia that is uh, first uh, acute will become chronic because of the adoption of these sleep uh, behaviors and uh, also these uh, cognitions that are associated with sleep difficulties. So more specifically, those uh, maladaptive sleep behaviors include spending too much time in bed while awake, uh, having irregular sleep schedules, uh, daytime napping, and also doing activities that are incompatible with sleep in bed. Um, and in terms of erroneous beliefs about sleep, that includes uh, beliefs that are very common in the general population. So for example, I need eight hours of sleep to function well during the day, or um, attributing what goes wrong during the day to the sleep difficulties. So if I am in a bad mood today, it's because I didn't sleep well uh, yesterday. <clears throat> and one that is very uh, critical in the context of cancer is the belief that if I don't sleep well, my cancer will come back. So obviously when you have that kind of thoughts or uh, beliefs and you go to bed, uh, you may not be in the best um, condition to uh, fall asleep easily. And indeed, uh, these uh, faulty beliefs about sleep will uh, induce what we call performance anxiety. So this is when um, wanting too much uh, something increase uh, the anxiety and thus uh, produce the contrary uh, results. So for example, if you play golf and you really want to, um, to, um, to succeed, uh, you may feel very anxious and that can uh, decrease your ability to, um, to succeed in your, in your uh, playing. So um, it's the same uh, phenomenon with insomnia. So because you uh, want to, uh, to sleep uh, you, and you, you think, I really need to sleep tonight because otherwise tomorrow this and that will happen, then you feel a, a lot of anxiety, and this is a state that is incompatible with the state that is required to fall asleep easily. And for the maladaptive sleep behaviors, um, 
the way it um, it influenced the maintenance of sleep difficulties over time is through uh, the desynchronization of the biological clock. And also because some of these behaviors uh, weaken the association that should exist between the bedroom and sleep. For good sleepers, when they it uh, when their head hit the pillow, it's like a clear signal for their brain that it's time for sleep. Whereas for insomnia patients, uh, because they tend to spend too much time in their bedroom while they're awake or, or in their bed, more particularly. Uh, the signal is not as clear. So the, the brain is not too sure whether it's time for sleep or it's time for insomnia. So this is something that needs to be um, uh, corrected in the intervention. Chronic insomnia is not a trivial problem. There are many uh, negative consequences of having insomnia in the long term. Uh, as I said earlier, it can be associated with increased fatigue, which is, which is already uh, a common symptom associated with cancer. It can also be associated with cognitive difficulties, uh, impaired daytime functioning. Uh, research has shown also that uh, having an insomnia uh, disorder is associated with an increased risk to um, develop later on uh, a depressive or an anxiety uh, disorder, or even a substance abuse disorder. Uh, impaired quality of life is also among the negative consequences, having some uh, other medical conditions. Uh, an increased risk of infection during chemotherapy has also been found in the literature, and also increased healthcare utilization. So it's really important to uh, address um, insomnia, especially when it's chronic. Unfortunately, sleep uh, problems are underdiagnosed in routine care. And in a study that uh, Judith Davidson conducted in uh, 2007, she asked uh, cancer patients um, who had sleep difficulties whether they had talked about their sleep difficulties with their oncologist. And what they said was that the they didn't because uh, they were reluctant to report their sleep difficulties because they believed that it was not appropriate to report uh, those difficulties to the oncologist. They also felt that it was the lesser of the two problems um, between cancer and sleep difficulty. They didn't want to complain and they also um, uh, they were afraid that they would only be prescribed some sleeping pills. And they also said that um, health professionals did not inquire about uh, their sleep at all, that no treatment were offered when they talked about their sleep difficulties, and that doctors didn't have any time to talk about their sleep. And there's also other reasons for uh, underdiagnosis. Um, mainly sleep difficulties are tend to be trivial, trivialized both by healthcare professionals and patients. And um, actually, they, they often believe that sleep difficulties will fade away by themselves if or if an appropriate treatment for psychological distress is initiated. For example, when um, a, a someone receives uh, a treatment for depression, it is a common belief that uh, insomnia will fade away uh, because when the depression is going to be treated. But we know from uh, the research that uh, often depression will, um, will be remitted, but that insomnia will remain. So a specific intervention that targets sleep difficulties is uh, needed in, in many cases. So is this where Kelly? Stops, yeah, for I sure. think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Your, your information is so great that I, yeah, I just, I will offer a little bit of my story and perspective just to give it some, some legs. Um, so I was diagnosed in April of last year, but it was actually while I was wrapping Christmas presents in 2021 that I felt a lump in my abdomen. And I can tell you right now that my sleep difficulties started not long after that, <laughs> um, as I was 
experienced quite a bit of anxiety. I had some difficulties getting the doctors to take me seriously, um, getting the testing that was necessary for the original cyst removal surgery that I had in April of 2022. Um, it was during that surgery that I was diagnosed with um, high-grade serous cancer, and I had my a follow-up surgery in June of 2022, which was my complete hysterectomy, omenectomy, oophorectomy, lymphonectomy. <laughs> um, and that, of course, put me into surgical menopause right away. Um, and then six weeks later, in July, I began my chemotherapy and I had six rounds. So six rounds, but every round was two sessions. So I had 11 out of my 12 sessions of chemo, which was both IV and intraperitoneal. So I had it pumped right into my abdomen and, you know, being full of chemo liquid didn't make sleeping super easy. Um, I'm now on a maintenance medication. I'm on a PARP inhibitor actually um, since January. And that has had lots of ups and downs. And I know I saw someone say that they thought their PARP um, caused insomnia as well. And I would agree. Uh, it causes me a, a ton of fatigue as well. And I've had, you know, I've needed a blood transfusion as a result. And plus in survivorship, I think any teal sister will tell you that there's a lot of anxiety that comes along with that. Now, I was I was la laughing as I was looking at your slides or not laughing, but kind of like thinking, oh my goodness, because I have all the predisposing factors. I have like 60 or 80% of the, uh, the middle factors. I was like, oh yeah, okay, it makes sense. But sleep has been something I've struggled with for a good portion of my life. And so it was something that I was pretty prepared to need to be really direct with my physician with about right away. And so like for me, when we talk about like, how do you talk to your healthcare provider? I think the, the most important thing um, is probably that we're very clear about the type of sleep issues that we're having. Um, so when I was extremely anxious after my first scan, when we still didn't know if I had cancer, I went to my family doctor and I literally said, I am so anxious that I cannot sleep. I am not coping. My daily life is becoming unbearable. <laughs> Please help me. Like I had to be very specific because just exp expressing distress does not necessarily get you the assistance that you are hoping for. Um, and she was, you know, and then during treatment again, like I always thought it was odd that they would, you talked about how patients weren't sure about whether or not they should talk to their oncologist. Well, they would say like, how are you sleeping? And I would say terrible. And then they would just move on to the next question. And we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like this is causing me psychological distress. Please help me. Um, so I think that that being specific, also being specific about the type of sleep issues that you're having when you speak to your physician can be really helpful. So saying like, I'm having trouble going to sleep or like for me, I always like, I wake up 14 times during the night. Um, during chemo, I had really in, one of my main symptoms was like egregious pain in my bones and my joints. And I had to say like, the pain is keeping me awake. <laughs> Like, how can I help? And then also have an idea. I, I think what helped me was having an idea of what I was willing, like what strategies I was willing to employ and what I wasn't. Um, so whether that's, you know, pharmacological, like uh, medications or other um, other strategies, which I know you're going to talk about. Um, but that, because like for me, like I'm, I'm the funny thing about me getting cancer and going through this entire thing is like, I'm very leery of medication. And so I had to be really clear about what I was looking for lots of times. Um, yeah, I think, I think that kind of speaks to that portion. I'll hand it back over to Dr. Spard. Thank you. I, I think that this is very um, interesting to, to hear your, your story and see, and, and I think it illustrates very clearly how many stressors uh, you have experience and that may add an effect on, on sleep. Obviously, it would have an effect having so many stressors to uh, to live. So uh, I'm going to be talking about um, the pharmacological treatment of insomnia because even though it's not considered the treatment of choice, especially when insomnia is chronic, 
we know that is it is the most prescribed and the most used as well. Um, so the first class of medication that I'm going to be uh, talking about is um, benzodia benzodiazepines. Uh, those used to be very commonly prescribed, but are less uh, prescribed. At, at, have begun to be less prescribed over uh, recent years because we know now that they are associated with a uh, high risk of dependence, especially a psychological dependence. So um, now uh, more frequently, uh, doctors are going to uh, prescribe non-benzodiazepines or the so-called Z drugs. And uh, we believe uh, from the, the research data that have been published that those are associated with a lower risk of dependence. And there's also a new class of medication that is called orexin receptor antagonist. So that includes uh, medications such as lamborexin and suvorexin. And these medications um, act through a very different uh, mechanism of action. Um, there are less studies that have been conducted, and uh, we think that they are less associated with a risk of dependence as well, but we'll, we'll see over uh, the next few, few years with the, the studies that uh, are gonna be uh, conducted. Uh, the antidepressants and the antipsychotics are less commonly used. Uh, they are used mostly when uh, doctors want to have a du dual effects. So for example, if a patient has both depression and sleep difficulties, they may prescribe uh, that kind of antidepressant. And <clears throat> uh, for the over-the-counter medications or uh, substances, uh, melatonin is very frequently uh, used. Uh, however, when we look at the empirical uh, data, there's a lack of evidence on uh, its efficacy in the treatment of insomnia. We know that it is effective to um, treat or to prevent uh, jet lag or uh, treat some um, circadian rhythm disorders, but for insomnia, the evidence is lacking. Some, some people say that it is effective and that's fine if it's useful for you, but um, Otherwise, in, uh, in general, the, the research has not been uh, conclusive. Uh, one kind of uh, substances that should be avoided is antihistaminic medications. And because those um, uh, may have an effect, a beneficial effect on sleep, but they induce a lot of drowsiness. So when you wake up in the morning, you don't feel really good. You don't feel very sharp. And um, that may be uh, risky for uh, for those who have um, uh, risky uh, jobs or uh, if if you uh, drive and uh, things like that. So um, you, one may be uh, needs to be careful with those medications. And the other natural products have not been studied extensively, so there's a lack of efficacy data as well. So. That's for the pharmacological treatment. <clears throat> uh, in general, um, um, there are a lot of residual effects the next day, um, especially uh, with benzodiazepines and um, to a lesser extent with the Z drugs, but still, so um, patients will experience some somnolence. Uh, it can also include dizziness, cognitive and motor uh, functioning uh, decreases. But the main problem is that uh, a tolerance will develop. So what it means is that in order to have the same treatment effect, um, you may need to increase the dosage of the medication. So, and that will create a, a vicious cycle in which uh, you use the medication for um, long-term and then the effect decreases and then you increase the dosage and that will increase also uh, the risk of dependence, especially psychological dependence. So um, 
uh, people will think that they can no longer sleep without a medication. And um, and also when uh, um, you try to stop uh, using the medication after a while, uh, you may also experience what is called a rebound insomnia. So this is when uh, insomnia uh, reoccur because you have stopped the medication and sometimes to um, a more severe level than when you first introduce uh, a sleep medication. And although uh, you may found that uh, you may find that uh, using a sleep medication uh, will um, make you sleep more deeply, uh, if when uh, when patients come to the lab, we can see that uh, actually uh, using a sleep medication is associated with uh, less deep sleep. So um, that is also something to uh, consider. So. Because of all of those limitations, uh, the medical associations such as the NIH or the American Association of Sleep Medicine have recommended to um, use CBTI as the first line uh, treatment for chronic insomnia and to use hypnotic medications um, more specifically for transient and situational insomnia for a duration that does not exceed four to six weeks. Um, to the smallest dosage possible. And if a daily chronic usage is, um, uh, is uh, necessary, uh, one may need to uh, follow up um, in order to make sure that the effect is maintained over time. So uh, now I'm going to move on to CBTI, so cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And as I said earlier, the intervention is, go is going to target more specifically those perpetuating factors. So those factors that are very influential in maintaining the problem over time. We don't target uh, the precipitating factors. So those factors that triggered the onset of insomnia, because some of them are not um, amenable to changes easily. So for example, hot flashes, as you know, uh, in uh, women who had uh, cancer, um, uh, replacement hormone therapy, which is the most effective treatment for menopausal symptoms is not uh, indicated in, uh, in women who had uh, cancer. So uh, because of that, the intervention needs to uh, target more specifically the factors that maintain the, the insomnia over time. And those are the components of the intervention. Um, and I just wanted to mention that relaxation can be added to uh, the treatment, but the research has found that it's not a necessary component uh, in order to uh, achieve um, some um, some uh, positive treatment effects. So uh, you may want to use relaxation. If it's helpful for you, uh, that's a good thing, but otherwise it's not um, uh, a necessary component of the intervention uh, to be uh, successful. Uh, this is only to emphasize that CBT for insomnia has been found to be effective in the specific context of cancer. And um, more specifically, it's been found to not only improve sleep, but also to decrease psychological distress. So anxiety and depressive symptoms, uh, decrease fatigue and uh, increases quality of life as well. So uh, the first uh, strategies that I'm going to talk about um, is uh, stimulus control. And there are two goals to that strategy. The first one is to reinforce the association between the bed uh, with sleep and to establish a regular sleep-wake rhythm. So as you, you will see, uh, we do have um, very practical strategies to attain those two goals. The first one is to uh, keep at least one hour before going to bed to relax. And this is because we don't have any on-off switch in order to order in order to induce sleep. So and it it's impossible to um, transition from 
an activation state where you are busy working or um, you're doing physical exercise to uh, to sleep. So it's it's very helpful to um, to keep at least an hour to wind down and to really to reduce the activation and induce the sleepiness, which is uh, we can say the first stage of sleep. So in that time, it is recommended to do activities that prepare for sleep, such as reading, watching TV, listening to music. Uh, it's important to be cautious about electronic tablets, cell phones, although those uh, have uh, now, um, uh, it's possible to reduce the, the light intensity. So you, you may want to, to do that, but if you, you find that it it is associated with some activation. It's better not to use them before going to to bed, and it's also helpful to have a routine that is repeated every night. So it is another signal for the brain that it's gonna be the time soon for sleep. Uh, the second strategy is to uh, go to bed only when you feel sleepy, and. Uh, it's important to distinguish uh, sleepiness from fatigue. So fatigue is what you feel when uh, you have a lack of energy to do activities, such after um, intense exercising or a busy day at work. Whereas sleepiness is more the uh, envy to close eyes, to lie down, uh, to yawn, uh, nodding, heavy, eyelids, uh, having uh, watery eyes. And this is what we're looking for as a sign to go to bed, because as I said earlier, it's like the first stage of sleep. So similarly to um, the fact that you don't eat before uh, being hungry, it's important to go to bed only when you feel sleepy. It's like, um, otherwise it's gonna take longer to fall asleep. Uh, so the third strategy is to um, uh, leave the bedroom and return uh, to bed um, when unable, uh, let me say that differently, when any, when you're unable to fall asleep or go to back, back to sleep within 20 to 30 minutes, it is recommended to leave the bedroom and return to bed only when you feel sleepy again. And that one is important to reinforce the association or the conditioning between the bed and sleep. So in that meantime, you do uh, activities uh, again that induce sleepiness. So reading, watching TV and so on. And it's important not to return to bed too soon and to wait for sleepiness to occur again, uh, in order to make sure that uh, sleep onset is gonna, is gonna be uh, rapid. And uh, it is needed to repeat this step as often as necessary. So uh, in the first week or first two or three weeks, uh, it may happen that you have to do that more than one time uh, during the night. This is difficult but it is very effective um, after uh, a couple of weeks, you will see a difference if you do that very uh, regularly. Uh, next is to arise at the same time every morning, even uh, on weekends and following poor night sleep. So this one is difficult also, and uh, but it's important to resynchronize the biological clock to really have a regular sleep schedule. So we do recommend to use an alarm every day in order to make sure that uh, you awake at the same time uh, every morning or about the same time. And uh, next, uh, it is recommended to use the bedroom for sleep and sexual activities only. So do not eat, watch TV, work, use cell phone, electronic, and, and, and electronic tablet or, re or even read in the bedroom. So what we want to do in the initial stage of that intervention is to really reassociate the bed with sleep. 
So, um, so it's important not to do any activities that are incompatible with sleep, even uh, reading in the first stage of, um, of the intervention. Later on, you may want to reintroduce some of those habits, but at, initially it's important to try to avoid all of those things in order to maximize the treatment effects initially. The next one is also difficult, particularly for patients receiving uh, cancer treatments. Um, and um, it's important again to, um, to reestablish a regular sleep schedule. Uh, but if um, a nap is necessary, it, we recommend that it, it is done before 3 p.m in the bedroom because we want to associate the bed with sleep and uh, of a duration of less than 60 minutes or shorter. And uh, this is uh, the rationale for that is that we, uh, not we, but uh, the research has found that when we do nap uh, later on during uh, the afternoon or uh, early in the evening, uh, that sleep is going to be characterized by, by a lot of deep sleep. And that deep sleep is going to be uh, uh, the, the sleep you, you will have uh, the night afterward uh, will be less characterized by deep sleep because it's like it's been uh, taken uh, by uh, the it's been uh, taken by the naps. So it, it's like uh, you don't have your sleep is going to be lighter and more um, interrupted by uh, some uh, wake episodes. So it's important to do that earlier during the day if you have to do napping. The last uh, behavioral strategy is a little bit more complex, but um, put simply, it is uh, initially to uh, limit the time you spend in bed to the actual sleep time that you get um, on average during a uh, week time. So for example, um, uh, when we do use a CBT in, uh, <clears throat> in the clinic, we ask patients to fill out a sleep diary, sorry, this one is in French, um, in order to have a, a very precise estimation of sleep duration, but th this is not something that needs to be done. You can estimate that more roughly. And for example, here, uh, Peter uh, went to bed at uh, 11 p.m. and got up at 8 in the morning. So that makes uh, nine hours of time spent in bed. But among those hours, he only slept about six hours on average because he fell asleep around midnight and remained awake about two hours uh, during the night time. So uh, the first stage of the sleep restraint restriction strategy will be to reduce the time spent in bed to six hours. So for example, Peter could go to bed at midnight and get out at six in the morning for at least a week and uh, until his sleep efficiency increases to at least 85%. And this is defined as the um, this total sleep time on uh, total time spent in bed. So here you see that initially uh, Peter had only a sleep efficiency of 67%, which is not a lot. That means that only 67% of the time he spent in bed was sleep time. And what we are at our goal is that to increase that to 85% at least. So the goal is to consolidate the sleep over a shorter period. Here you see on the line um, on, at, the, at the top of the slide, you, you see that the sleep time is interrupted by a lot of wake time. And the objective is to reduce that and to have a more a shorter uh, time uh, spent in bed, but that is more characterized by a, a, a consolidate a sleep period that is not uh, as much interrupted by um, awakenings. 
And finally, I'm going to be uh, talking about cognitive, uh, some of the cognitive beliefs um, that uh, may have a, a negative impact on uh, on sleep. And one of them is uh, the belief that uh, we we need absolutely eight hours of sleep to function well during the day. So what we do. Uh, is to encourage uh, patients to uh, look at the evidence that this belief is true or not true. So we want to um, uh, have them um, try to interpret that in a more realistic way. And so they, they can, uh, by questioning the validity of those uh, beliefs. So what is the evidence that this belief is true or not true? What is the worst that could really happen if you don't sleep well? So that um, a more realistic um, view is developed with regards to uh, to that. So for example, it could be if I stop worrying about the impact of insomnia, I might sleep well because I, as I explained earlier, performance anxiety is a uh, is a factor that really influence uh, sleep. Um, not everybody needs eight hours each night to function well. A lot of people um, think that it's an absolute norm, but it, it is not. It, the The needs in sleep duration vary from one person to the other. And the sleep restriction strategy is helpful to, um, to really determine how many sleep you really need. Uh, by night. Even if I don't sleep eight hours, I will still be able to function. I do most of the time. I'll just feel uh, more sleepy at times during the day, which will help me sleep well tomorrow night. So the, the goal is to decatastrophize the sleep difficulties, reduce the performance anxiety. And um, the other one that I really need to talk about is the, the belief that if uh, I don't sleep well, my cancer will come back. And I, as I said earlier, this one is very tricky because it can induce a lot of performance anxiety. Again, we encourage patients to look at the evidence that poor sleep causes cancer recurrence um, and uh, to question the validity of that, um, of that belief, for example, by asking uh, oneself, do all insomniacs have cancer recurrence? Do all good sleepers have no cancer recurrence? And the truth is that there is no scientific evidence that insomnia could cause by itself a cancer recurrence. Uh, we know that cancer is a complex disease and that recurrence is influenced by a variety of factors that are often uh, unfortunately unknown and that it is very unlikely that insomnia alone can cause a recurrence. And that worrying about the consequences of insomnia only make the problem worse. So again, uh, the goal here is to decatastrophize. Chronic insomnia is associated with negative consequences, but when you go to bed, it's not the time to think about them and uh, to focus on what you can do to improve your sleep rather than uh, worrying about the possible consequences of not sleeping well. Dr. Savard, I I, I know I'm done. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> I just wanted to conclude by um, giving some resources. So if you um, speak French, I published a book uh, a couple of years ago in which there's a chapter on insomnia. Otherwise, my colleagues in uh, Ontario, Judith Davidson, published a very good book also. And if you're a uh, healthcare professionals, I published uh, uh, two years ago, a handbook of sleep di disorders in various medical conditions, including cancer. So that's it, I'm done, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excellent, no, I apologize. We have one more session to get through. So I wanna thank both you and yeah. Kaylee for that excellent information. We're not gonna have time for questions, but I will reach out to Dr. Savard after and we'll do our best yeah. to get the answers to those questions for you. So thank you both again so much sure. for thank you. the wonderful information. And Kaylee, thank you for sharing your experiences with us.